ProSettings.net covers the hardware and configs that all pro players use, and recently published this summary of the most popular stuff. It's important to know that using the same gear as a pro player won't guarantee you the same success, nor are these necessarily the best choices for you, personally, to use. But if you're looking to use a PC and configuration that won't stop you from playing well, then copying how the pros do it is probably a good place to start. And they're not the only ones sharing their skills. The best time to discover a new skill was 10 years ago. The second best time is now. And if you want to learn from experts in their field, then this video sponsor, Skillshare, is a great resource to check out, both to discover new topics, hobbies and crafts, and also to hone existing ones. Who knows what you'll find as you go down the rabbit hole? Whether you'd like to explore behind the scenes of a large YouTuber such as MKBHD's channel, or to discover the secrets of video editing from the advice of a professional in his field, you'll find short, concise classes, free of ads, on these topics and more as well as a profile page for each so you can comfortably know that you're in safe hands as you're learning about whatever topic you find yourself currently captivated by. And you may find yourself inspired by the passion that they display for their craft. You can check out a number of free classes, but the first thousand people to use the link in this video's description will get a free one month premium membership trial to help you to explore your creativity. So yeah, I'll be going through this summary of pro players equipment in this video, sharing with you why I think it is the way it is, along with the occasional controversial belief of my own just to give the comments section something to talk about. Now there's no doubt that what pro players game on is going to be influenced by what their team sponsors are. So if a specific company provides lots of different pro players their equipment, then of course those things are more likely to make this list. It doesn't mean that those products are objectively the best choice out there, but pros aren't going to jeopardise their chances of winning by using something that's inherently bad. So watching this video, sponsors are something to be aware of, which I'm noting here to acknowledge, but I don't think it matters too much. It is, after all, still the stuff that the best players in the world are gaming on, so either it's good enough to get them to that level, or it's not bad enough to prevent them from reaching it. Let's begin. Mice. When it comes to mice, I think you should forget all about them, because an Xbox controller is the way to go. No, it isn't. Mice. The choice of mouse is, of course, very important. You want a mouse that can track your hand movements precisely, but you'd be surprised by how many cheap ones there are out there which epically fail to fulfil this seemingly basic task. I've had mice where making a circular motion results in a square movement on screen. I've had some that cause my cursor to jitter, as though there's fluff stuck in the sensor. One of the mice I tested, if stopped suddenly, continued moving on screen, grinding gradually to a stop instead. Proper nightmare stuff. Real savage. So you don't want any of that. But even expensive mice and sensors, without these glaring flaws, can still suffer from things like acceleration and smoothing issues. What this could mean is that moving at 10cm quickly will move your aim a different amount from moving the mouse 10cm more slowly. This is bad because it defeats your muscle memory, unless literally every motion you make with the mouse is the exact same speed and duration, which it won't be. So yeah, these mice here will be solid choices, because even if their sensors aren't perfect, they're good enough that you can still become a pro by using them. But don't rule out other mice types and brands as well. The ones listed here only account for two thirds of pros after all. It's worth looking through the list of pro player setups, which is again from the pro setting site, which I'll link to in the description. And there may be other good choices beyond what's listed there too. Just be sure to find out which sensor they use and look online to see what the general consensus is about that specific sensor. And don't, whatever you do, buy a cheap gaming mouse on Amazon, because the thousands of five star reviews on that site aren't to be trusted. Beyond the sensor, you've got to consider the weight of the mouse, the size and the number and placement of the buttons. I prefer lighter mice because even though I can move a heavier one, I can move a lighter one more quickly and more precisely. So even with ones with customisable weights, I tend to just leave it as empty as possible. For general use, I like to use a mouse with a DPI button, but if all you're doing is gaming on it, then you should perhaps stick to one sensitivity instead and to master that. I've been using wireless mice for a number of years now and don't believe there is a difference between a good wireless mouse and a corded one in terms of latency and stuff. Besides, this wireless Logitech mouse is the second most popular option for pro play. But just remember that it will require charging in some form or another. And whichever mouse you have, please make sure that mouse acceleration is disabled in the software. Though apparently even acceleration isn't enough to stop 2% of players from going pro. But as a whole, these stats here pretty much say to me that pro players use their mice properly and without bad options enabled, which may hinder their performance. Should I even get involved in the low sensitivity versus high sensitivity debate? Most people will insist that low is better, and the pros seem to agree with this, or with what you can see listed over on this site. But I've personally always preferred higher. Please try things for yourself and use what works best for you. 
and don't give in to peer pressure. I moved to a lower sensitivity and have never managed to get back the magic that I used to feel at a higher one. Mouse pad. Mouse pads can help reduce friction, can keep your mouse's Teflon feet cleaner and in better condition, and may feel nicer to use than being on a cold, hard desk. So there are plenty of reasons for why you'd want to use one, but I'm not the right person to ask about this since I've used a basic desk for years, and before then I used this ridiculous little pull-out board which I loved because it kept my hand super close to my waist which I found gave me inhuman accuracy with flick shots. Much like high sensitivity, I'd miss this thing but I wouldn't advise that any of you follow my insane setup, so perhaps ask somebody else which mouse mat is best for you. The keyboard. The choice of keyboard is not as important as your choice in mouse. I'm yet to encounter a keyboard with noticeable latency, and I really think that your character's movement in CSGO is several tiers of importance below the ability to be able to aim quickly and responsively. Which keyboard is best for you mostly depends on what kind of click you like, and whether you want RGB or not. There is also this thing called rollover, which is how many and which keys can be pressed at the same time. Of course, you want for your character to be able to crab walk back and to the left at the same time as he's equipping a flashbang and jumping, so it pays to make sure that your keyboard can register a worst case scenario like this, which can be done on this site, which I've linked to in the description. Another thing to consider is the form factor of your keyboard. Working with numbers, I love my numpad, which also has lots of keys which can be configured for buy buttons and so on in CSGO but there is a case to be made for smaller, more compact keyboards as well. If you're gaming in a place with limited desk space, it could be worth considering a 10 keyless design like these ones here. I've seen pros using keyboards at all sorts of strange angles just to maximise the space they have for their mouse, which might be why smaller form factors are becoming more popular in recent years. Headset. This is a tough one. There are a billion different headsets out there, and everybody has different tastes, so no matter what I say here, somebody out there will insist that I'm wrong about it. From the one shown here, I think it's safe to say that a built-in microphone is handy for gaming. Compared with a desktop mic, one built into your headset helps keep your voice at a consistent volume and distance from your mouth, and it's one less cable you have to deal with. Comfort ranks up there as being one of the most important aspects of a headset, given that it'll be wrapped around your face for hours a day. Get one with cups big enough to go over your ears and, I don't know, look up reviews to ensure the one you're buying is comfortable for extended gameplay sessions. You have good quality audio and then you have gamer audio, and there are a few things you may want from a gamer headset that audiophiles will disagree with. For a start, you'll want a closed headset. This is the sort that stops external sounds from being heard. It generally makes the audio quality worse than an open headset because it echoes around more inside or something like that, but this is more than outweighed by the benefit of it allowing you to escape into your own personal space away from real world noises whenever you start your gaming sessions. Having mostly opted for audiophile headsets in the past, believing audio quality and accuracy to be more important than anything else, I have to admit I still prefer the amped up bass that is typically seen in gaming headsets. One thing I dislike though are headsets with surround sound. I would avoid gimmicky features like 7.1 speakers or a surround sound button, which I found are more hassle than they're worth. You have two ears, all you should need are two speakers and some clever software mixing which is all done by the game you're playing anyway. Some headsets have a wider soundstage than others, which means they separate the left and right channels better and it makes it easier to tell which direction sounds are coming from. Having bought headsets in the past for this feature, I can tell you that it ranks lower in importance than some of the other things I've talked about here already. Monitors. Unlike headsets, monitors are easier. The higher the hertz, the better. That should be your primary objective when it comes to buying a monitor for competitive gaming. It makes your mouse movements feel more responsive, and any motion on screen looks more natural. This is all going to sound like a load of rubbish, but I genuinely believe that my subconscious performed better at aiming at stuff when it's fed more regular screen refreshes, no matter how much I may be paying attention to my actions. But how many hertz do you need? 144Hz was the standard for a long time, then 240, and now you can see that 360Hz monitors are beginning to creep in. These still only take up a tiny proportion of pro setups, but I expect that figure to grow in future years. You want more hertz because it cuts down the delay between what happens and what's shown on your screen. Obviously there are other factors to consider here as well, like ghosting, latency and all that, but a decent monitor review should address these things. And the pros choices here will be a good place to start from. Don't buy a monitor without reading reviews first, but yeah, hertz is king. The jury's still out over how many hertz you really need. I believe there were some eye tracking tests done for VR at some point, and I think it was concluded that it would require thousands of hertz before there's an imperceivable delay, but we don't have the technology for that just yet. So 240 hertz is a decent high-end gaming standard to shoot for for now. But ask yourself if you want this, like if you really want this above all else. 
because jumping to a higher refresh rate is a thankless task. You won't notice the difference, but you certainly will when you're trying to return to a lower one again. And also consider what else you might be doing with your computer. 360Hz 1080p monitors are perfect for pro CSGO players, but for a more immersive, slower paced game, I think a 60Hz 4K HDR screen would be better, and a 1440p 144Hz screen is still the best all round gaming compromise. Don't get me wrong, I switch over to, and I appreciate, my 180Hz 1080p screen when I'm feeling competitive, but most games favour the clearer definition of a higher resolution. And when I'm making as many videos as I do, I prefer extra resolution when I'm working on the desktop so often. So yeah, what you should be looking for from a monitor very much depends on how hardcore you are with your competitive gaming, because a monitor is a big investment to make and there will be compromises to whatever you choose, even if you're spending £3,000. Resolution. So you've got your monitor, now which resolution do you use on it? This is another area where pro players deviate from the status quo. Most people, and gamers, would want to use their monitor at its native resolution, else risk blurriness. But not pro players, oh no. Only 9% of them use 1080p screens correctly. The rest of them force lower resolutions and strange aspect ratios out of them, more in line with what you'd have seen on a CRT monitor from 15 years ago. Some of these even deliberately stretch the screen. So let's go through all of these options and see what is right for you. 1920 by 1080 used properly, delivers the widest field of view, an aspect ratio of 16 by 9, which you can think of as being 16 across and 9 down. Most pro players on the other hand use 4x3, which you can imagine as being 12 across and 9 down. Hence they don't have as much peripheral vision as a 16x9 player would. And then, in addition to this, 75% of pros use stretched, meaning that they use 4x3 that's stretched to fit a 16x9 monitor which results in shorter, stockier character models. Why? Well, I would ask them, but I have no pro player friends. So I'm just going to have to speculate on this. Monitors used to use the 4x3 aspect ratio and ran at higher hertz at lower resolutions. So it did used to make sense for pros to use these settings. So I'm wondering if some pro players still use these settings out of habit, or if maybe even today's generation of pros, when they first started out, looked at what the older generation of pros were using and copied them just like you're trying to do to them now. If that's the case, break the chain. Stick to 16x9 and embrace the wider screen. Don't be held back by those who came before you. But I believe that there is more to it than that. At the end of the day, you're looking at the centre of your screen. With good positioning and a bit of game sense, you can almost guarantee that you will spot enemies who dare challenge you. And when they show themselves on a 4x3 aspect ratio, especially one that's stretched to fill the entire 16x9 display, they're going to appear much bigger and fatter than they would do on a 16x9 monitor that's being used properly. Does this mean gaming at 4x3 is some kind of cheat by making everything look bigger? No, I don't think so. Two Clicks Philip took this to the next level by gaming on a big screen to see if bigger targets were easier to hit. And of course it didn't work like that. The idiot. And while they may appear wider and thus easier to hit, they'll appear to move faster across the screen as well. So while it's a difficult thing to get your head around, I don't think that stretching enemies to make them appear fatter will make them easier to hit. Which gets me onto the real reason why I think that pro players use these settings. And it just happens to be the last part of this video. And that's the hardware. I think that pros use lower resolutions and weird aspect ratios because that means there are fewer pixels to render so that the game will run at a higher frame rate, and thus pro players will perform better on them. You know the whole more hertz is better argument from earlier? The same principle applies to the game's frame rate. Sure, there are diminishing returns, but more is always better. Some people will still insist that you only need 60 frames a second to make the most of a 60 hertz monitor, which is wrong, all you need to do is to run a game at 240 frames a second on a 60 hertz monitor and you'll feel the difference. It becomes less laggy, even though the same number of frames are being displayed every second. There is reason to this madness. More frames per second equals more consistent frame times, and, on average, less latency between what's going on and what the monitor's displaying, and so on. Something I believe is represented by that handy little VAR number in the corner of the screen. So by using these horrendously low resolutions and antiquated, anti antiquated aspect ratios, it may bump the frame rate up enough that it does make a noticeable difference to how fluid the game feels to a pro player. But don't get too smug. Most hardware can already run the game at hundreds of frames a second, and especially with the latest generation of Ryzen processors, I believe we're approaching the point where we may finally have the technology to run CSGO at 1080p. In fact, 
it's baffling to me that ProSettings.net lists the GPU that these players are using but doesn't mention the CPU, because especially at lower resolutions, the processor has more of an impact than the GPU does. In my opinion, modern processors can be split into three categories. At the bottom are the first generations of Ryzen and older Intel i series of processors. And when I say older, I mean stuff that's approaching 5 or even 10 years old now. But don't think that these are bad. Even these can easily run the game well into the triple digits. In any other game, this sort of performance would be overkill. Even in CSGO, it's not like this is going to hold you back until you reach a relatively high level of ability, or are wielding a 240Hz monitor. I need to elaborate that these are still good processors. When people talk about struggling to run CSGO, they're talking about rigs far below these. These are still good processors, Brett. But since we're talking about pro level, we'll move up to the next tier and assume that this is what's required to go pro. At this performance level, I don't think that even pro players will feel the urge to upgrade anytime soon. The single core performance of these processors is still phenomenal, and to think CSGO of all games requires more than this to run is laughable. Hilarious. But then we reach this final tier, the Ryzen 5000 series. In my opinion, stands alone as being the next generation of CPU performance. And this is particularly felt in CSGO of all places. We've been stuck at that previous tier for so long that even I was beginning to ask myself if we were running into other limitations with the Source engine. But no, it is still a CPU limited game, and the Ryzen 5000 series has proven this by powering the game to much faster frame rates than everything else on the market right now. I doubt that many pros are even aware of this, let alone using this sort of hardware. From a quick Google search, it looks like Pro Player Simple is still on an Intel 10,000 series CPU. And why not? It's not like a new generation of processors immediately renders all those before it redundant, especially when it comes to playing a 9 year old game that pros have been playing without a problem for years already. But the point I'm trying to make is, it's clear you don't NEED a Ryzen 5000 series to go pro at CSGO, but now that they are a thing, then perhaps we can start to forego the low resolution, stretched displays of yesteryear. And I reckon that if you're equipped with one of these beauties, then pro performance, even at a high resolution like 1080p, is still attainable provided that your GPU is powerful enough to handle it. But of course, to get the best you pay a hefty premium for the Ryzen 5000 series, so for most people a more affordable option like an Intel i5 11400 or 1600 would perhaps be the better choice. Oh Intel, how the tables have turned. And for graphics cards, well the market's a joke right now, but any half decent GPU made in the last 5 years or so should be able to cope with the demands of CSGO, which may have become more demanding since its release, but not by that much. If in doubt, stick to a lower resolution and get CPU limited instead. So there you go, nothing is stood between you and going pro, but the thousands of hours of CSGO that you'll need to play.